Psalm The Death of Moses Some time later, Moses left the lowlands of Moab. He went up to Mount Pisgah to the peak of Mount Nebo, which is across the Jordan River from Jericho. The Lord showed him all the land as far north as Gilead, the town of Dan. He let Moses see the territories that would soon belong to the tribes of Naphtali, Ephraim, Manasseh and Judah, as far west as the Mediterranean Sea. The Lord also showed him the land in the south, from the valley near the town of Jericho, known as the city of palm trees, down to the town of Zoar. The Lord said to Moses, Moses, this is the land I was talking about when I solemnly promised Abraham, Isaac and Jacob that I would give land to their descendants. I have let you see it, but you will not cross the Jordan and go in. And so Moses, the Lord's servant, died there in Moab, just as the Lord had said. The Lord buried him in a valley near the town of Beth Peor, but even today no one knows exactly where. Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died, yet his eyesight was still good and his body was strong. The people of Israel stayed in the low ends of Moab where they mourned and grieved thirty days for Moses, as was their custom. Before Moses died, he had placed his hands on Joshua and the Lord had given Joshua wisdom. The Israelites paid attention to what Joshua said and obeyed the commands that the Lord had given Moses. There has never again been a prophet in Israel like Moses. The Lord spoke face to face with him and sent him to perform powerful miracles in the presence of the king of Egypt and his entire nation. No one else has ever had the power to do such great things as Moses did for everyone to see. Jesus Feeds 5,000 After Jesus heard about John, he crossed Lake Galilee to go to some place where he could be alone. But the crowds found out and followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus got out of the boat, he saw the large crowd. He felt sorry for them and healed everyone who was sick. That evening the disciples came to Jesus and said, this place is like a desert and it is already late. Let the crowds leave so that they can go to the villages and buy some food. Jesus replied, They don't have to leave. Why don't you give them something to eat? But they said, We have only five small loaves of bread and two fishes. Jesus asked his disciples to bring the food to him and he told the crowd to sit on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up towards heaven and blessed the food. Then he broke the bread and handed it to his disciples, and they gave it to the people. After everyone had eaten all they wanted, Jesus' disciples picked up twelve large baskets of leftovers. There were about five thousand men who ate, not counting the women and the children. The Prayer of an Innocent Person I am innocent, Lord. Won't you listen as I pray and beg for help? I am honest. Please hear my prayer. Only you can say that I am innocent because only your eyes can see the truth. You know my heart, and even during the night you have tested me and found me innocent. I have made up my mind never to tell a lie. I don't do like others. I obey your teachings, and I am not cruel. I have followed you without ever stumbling. I pray to you, God, because you will help me. Listen and answer my prayer. Show your wonderful love. Your mighty arm protects those who run to you for safety from their enemies. I am innocent, Lord, and I will see your face. When I awake, all I want is to see you as you are.
God's choice of Israel. I am a follower of Christ, and the Holy Spirit is a witness to my conscience. So I tell the truth, and I am not lying when I say my heart is broken, and I am in great sorrow. I would gladly be placed under God's curse and be separated from Christ for the good of my own people. They are the descendants of Israel, and they are also God's chosen people. God showed them his glory. He made agreements with them and gave them his law. The temple is theirs, and so are the promises that God made to them. They have those famous ancestors who were also the ancestors of Jesus Christ. I pray that God, who rules over all, will be praised for ever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy 34, 1 through 9. And our sermon title this morning is A View from the Mountain Shop. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Moses went out from the plains of Moab to the Mount of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is, op which is opposite Jericho, and the Lord showed him the whole land. Gilead as far as Dan, all Napoli and the land of Ephra and Massa, all the lands of Judea as far as the western sea, the New Gap and the plains, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zor. The Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Bethpur, but no one knew his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plain of Moab for 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moab had laid his hands on him and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. The reading of God's word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Bow with me. Gracious and loving God, we want a view from the mountaintop, just as Moses did so many years ago. We ask, Father God, that these words that I'm about to share are your words, and we can take these words with us wherever we go. Open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds to what you have in store for us this day. In Jesus' most precious and loving name we pray. Amen. In the lesson we read, Moses, the very old man, at the time climbs to the top of Mount Nebo and looks across the promised land. This is the land Moses had heard of but had never seen before. It's a strip of land that stretches along the Mediterranean Sea, a strip of land that was promised to Abraham and his descendants forever. And now, after 40 years of leadership, Moses was standing on the border of that land with thousands upon thousands of Abraham's grandchildren, the Israelites, in the valley below, about to enter in and take the land. When I read this passage, I had to think about high mountains. Believe it or not, I climbed a high mountain many years ago when I was a lot younger. I climbed a mountain 
in Shenandoah, Virginia, called the old, the old Rand. I was probably 21 or 22, and if it wasn't for the help of my friends, I probably wouldn't have made it. When I reached the peak of the mountain, I was really worn out and winded from the climb. I looked up the height of the old rag on the internet, and it stands about 4,000 feet high. In comparison, I looked up Mount Nebo that Moses climbed in his own age, and it was almost 12,000 feet high. How an old man of 120 climbed the mountain must have been an act of God. And then I thought, no wonder Moses died right after that. But God gets the age Moses, who we are told still has strong eyes and a strong body, as it tells us in Deuteronomy 34.7, to the top of the mountain in order to show Moses what is coming for his people in the near future. The promised land is just before them. Although Moses is not going to go into this land, God wants him to see what is ahead. I was drawn to this passage because I wanted to help you as a church to get up the mountain. In other words, I want to help draw you up to a place of perspective to see what is ahead as a church. My hope is that you go up this mountain. You can catch a vision of the promised land that God has in store for us. It's been laid on my heart to take this time to do just that, to bring, to begin, we are in this passage about Moses and Mount Nebo. Things change, a mantle is passed. When I think of this moment for Moses, it's important to realize this is not just a moment of insight about the future. This is also a period of change that the Israelites are living through. The mantle of leadership was being passed. Moses, who had led the people of Israel for 40 years, was giving leadership over to Joshua. So this was a new season for the Israelites. Like the Israelites, you as a church are also in a season of change. Over the last six months, you discerned as a church that your continued ministry was going to take place outside of the United Methodist Church, the denomination that had been home for this church for over 55 years. Not an easy decision, but as you talked and discerned about leaving, it was clear that the dysfunction and the various fractions that have consumed the United Methodist Church has been growing in costly distractions. So you decided to leave. Are you seeing that it is proof that God, God's work works things out and in perfect timing? Another change is that you will become a member of a new denomination. You will be a church in the global Methodist church. This will allow this church to be in a movement that holds you accountable and supports us in practicing the faithful biblical ministry. This morning I'm here to take you up the mountain and give some perspective to remind us that these changes are really small things in comparison to God's great promise for us. What do I mean? Think back to Deuteronomy 34. The people of Israel had followed Moses for 40 years. They had been through so much with him. They had seen miracles. They had gone through many hardships. Many of them had been born in the time that Moses had been leading. He was all that they knew. 
as we read the mantle was being passed from Moses to Joshua. Moses would die on the mountain, but the people still had to go forward. Such a change for all that they knew and had experienced in the past must have felt enormous. But God showed Moses that the promised land was just ahead and in change in leadership could not overshadow the plans that God had in store for his people. God was determined that God was able to get his people into this promised land, knowing what is our promised land. We are living in a time of change, but there are small changes compared to what God has always determined that he wants to do with us and by us. I mean his church around the world. The promised land for the church is summed up in some words in the Gospel of John. It's, it's a promise Jesus gave to all his followers when he said, as the Father sent me into the world, I have sent you, as it tells us in John 20, verse 21. You are a people sent into the world. It's where God has always wanted us to go, but it's not about a commandment. It's what God is actively working to get us as his church. From the perspective, we should see that our primary calling is not for a certain hour of worship. It's not to make our own little social club at the corner of 12th Street and 6th Avenue. It's not to pr protect things that have such a value in comparison to eternity. Our calling is to go forward into the world with God's gospel, God's love for the unloved, God's power for the weak, God's grace for the sinner, and God's message of Jesus Christ. And any change we live through will always be made small in comparison to that great promise that God will take us, his church, into every corner of this world. We are not staying put. We are, we are not showing, we are not showing up. We are being sent out. If you look at those first disciples of Jesus, this is exactly what they lived for. The early apostles of the church were not motivated to increase their social influence. They weren't motivated by popularity and they were not driven by short-lived goals. Rather, they were overtaken by the simple idea that what they had found in Jesus was not for them alone, but for the whole world. In that spirit, I will take on any change if it gets me at all closer to what God has called us to be as his church. I can face any change knowing I am bound for the promised land. And in closing, what does it look like to be a church that lives into God's promise and God's work? There is a statement from the Global Methodist Church that intends to lay it out in some practical steps. As we close, I want to share that inspiration with you. It says that the Global Methodist Church is a church committed to making disciples of Jesus Christ who worship passionately, love extravagantly, and witness boldly. The Global Methodist Church is filled with warm-hearted, Jesus-loving, and Holy Spirited inspired people. Making disciples, worshiping passionately, loving extravagantly, witness fully, if we can go there, we're exactly where God wants us to be. Praise be to God. Amen.
friends, may we go forth today fully assured that life lived according to the high priorities of faith matters forever. Guided by the faithful one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live this week in confidence. Live this week in power. Live this week in the presence of our triune God. And may the joy of our Lord be with you. Amen. Thank you.